Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. Hey, I've, I've got a tremendous guest up for you today, fellow Air Force vet, and uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things, you know, like moral injury, transitions, some, some deep stuff. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, I just want to say, you know, uh, that if you're struggling with anything, remember the, the number to call is 988, right? I just want to throw that out there right away, just in case anything gets heavy. Uh, but we're going to talk about transition and a lot of those things, and, and like I said, moral injury, uh, workplace, um, and a lot of other things. So, uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll bring my guest in. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. So, today I've got Dave Nordell. So, Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, Keith. Thanks. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show. It's a gl- glad to have you on here. And uh, uh, I always love talking about well, all these topics, um, sure. especially when, when we first talked and, you know, talked about moral injury. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that here in, in a minute. But, uh, before we do, tell us a little bit about yourself, your your story. Yeah, well, first of all, man, for two Air Force guys on a podcast called Battle Buddy, I love because, you know, my my time in the Air Force was pretty joint. So I was around a lot of soldiers and, you know, Marines and that type of stuff. But we all are kind of battle buddies, right? I mean, you know, life is a battle no matter where you come from. And then you come from the DOD, so. Yeah, I, I was looking at that and I thought it's pretty. This is pretty appropriate, at least for what we're talking about today. So it's awesome and good. Good on you for doing this and making the platform. Yeah. So hey, uh, thirty years, six months, twenty four days in the Air Force, culminating as the you know the command chief for twentieth Air Force, the numbered Air Force. So you know, in the other services terms, it's Sergeant Major, Command Master Chief, or or uh, Command um, Command Sergeant Major uh, in the Army you know, at the battalion or the force level. So just to, just for everybody to reference, but, uh, you know, in, in there, you know, I grew up as a medic and, you know, when you grow up as a medic, it's a, it's a pretty interesting, interesting endeavor, which, uh, which is going to be kind of the crux of a lot of things that we talk about today. Grew up in a uh, small town in Northern California, uh, very rural, very conservative, uh, and very, uh, not very diverse, um, uh, milk and cows. So I lived 10 miles outside of town. My small town had one stoplight. It was in the wrong place. Uh, so they, you know, it's just, it's just one of those places that, you know, out of a movie, if you blink, you kind of miss it. Um, the only thing that it really had that was close was, uh, the interstate runs right next to it. But other than that, you can just kind of blow right through it and, and not, uh, and not really pay attention. And so in 1984, I, Packed up and went to basic training down in, you know, lovely San Antonio, Texas. Uh, in 1984, when I was down there from November into January of uh, of '85, uh, it snowed in San Antonio. Shut everything down, man. It just no wanted, way. Yeah, it snowed. I mean, it's the whole. In fact, we were told not to march. Our orders for the day were not to slip and fall. That's and we just walked. We walked everywhere, and I was fairly along in training where we were getting pretty, pretty good at marching and that kind of thing. No, nope, don't march. Just do not fall down. So it totally it looked, sounds like an air force knee jerk reaction. To oh, oh my gosh, was, there's snow. Oh, yeah, it's that, Texas. Yeah, nobody right. knows what to do. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody could get to work on the base to include the training instructors. Cause there was like 90,000 motor vehicle accidents in the middle of San Antonio. Now I'm up here in Montana. I, I'm up here in Montana and you know, I did a lot of Northern tier time. So it makes me laugh that, you know, that, that amount of snow can shut places down, but it is what it is. So, yeah. So, you know, as, as uh, I went into the air force to be, or, well, I, I was wanted to go in the Navy and be a plumber. The Navy recruiter on the day that they were all at my high school was an absolute jerk. And the air force guy put his arm around me and it started my journey in a whole different direction. I still told him I wanted to be a plumber. They did my aptitude test, told me I needed to be a medic. Best decision that ever happened. Um, you know, my education all leaned towards putting myself through nursing school, doing shock trauma, being an ER nurse. You know, I moonlighted even on my off time to do those kind of things. Put me into disaster management. I got a grad degree in disaster management. And, and along the way, and I'll give you a good anecdote. Here's a uh, here's a hot off the press kind of cool story. Uh, I went to independent duty school. So in the Air Force and the Navy, people understand that. You know, we're medics, but we're kind of like the doc. I mean, we just go. We're the only medical person for hundreds of miles around, and they train us to do that. So see your own patients, do your own pharmacy, do your labs, everything that goes along with kind of going to see the doctor, and we did it all on our own. One of the jobs that 
that took me to was being one of the first hundred guys in the UAV program, the Predator program out in Indian Springs in Nevada outside of Vegas. So when I got in that unit, we didn't even have airplanes. So I had to open a brand new squadron, bring in the airplanes, write the TOs, do all the things that go along with running a flying unit with an aircraft. So it's kind of, um, you know, Christopher Columbus or, you know, Neil Armstrong kind of stuff. And, uh, and so in a, in about three weeks, my kid is going overseas to augment because he's in the pred, he's in the pred program of the North Dakota National Guard. He's going almost to the same spot that we initially deployed that aircraft all those years ago. So there's some legacy, some generational legacy attached to the UAVs. Wow. So yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of me in a nutshell. You know, I, um, I retired in 2014. I've been out here swimming around in this big civilian space now for nine years. And uh, there's been uppity ups and downy downs in there. And I'm sure we'll get to all of that. And, and of course, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a bit of a mission here, you know, through my consulting company, which uh, obviously will fill in the blanks as we go. Uh, I'm on a mission here. So I hope I can, you know, spend some time sharing today. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw that across, scroll across the bottom, uh, okay, as always for the viewers. It'll be in the YouTube description and uh, uh, and the show notes and everything. But uh, maxfabconsulting.com. Just go ahead and tell us a little bit about your your company since you mentioned it. Sure. Well, MaxFab. Everybody goes, well, what's MaxFab? You know, and you want this catchy thing that's supposed to drive you to something. My last combat tour in 08 in Iraq, I was the senior medic for a whole country for the whole operation you know everything everything there funneled through the trauma center in balad uh, good bad or indifferent sometimes stabilized sometimes fresh off the battlefield sometimes civilians sometimes you know young children and, and and to include the enemy and when you're leading people in that situation you know the top priorities are everybody gets home you know physically mentally and emotionally safe and so on the way over you kind of collect your leadership thoughts when you're going to do that. And you know, it's a joint job and you got to work, you know, with people all over the country, but you got to take care of your, 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 your internal folks first. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road, you know, taking care of airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard men even. We had, we had some Coasties over there. And so I decided that we needed to have a rallying cry, something to, to try and get to every day or at least try to achieve. And that was, a set attitude, an expectation in the organization as an attitude. So I won't belabor you with the whole long story because it's a keynote speech, but um, I hate push-ups. So I said, we're going to do a lot of push-ups. So we did push-ups together. And, and inevitably, when you start to do that with a bunch of people that are either coming on shift, going off shift, you know, and, you know, do the traditional thing, catch everybody. When I, we'd stand up from doing push-ups, people would ask the, the very innocuous question, Chief, how are you doing? And that's an easy answer. Right? I'm good. I'm fine. You know, living the dream. There's a thousand answers. And I would say I'm maximum fabulous. And then I would get this inquisitive look like, what in the heck is that? Yeah, I'd never heard that one before, right? Right, right. And I would especially, give you the same look. <laughs> right, especially for an E9 to be running around going, hey, it's maximum fabulous, right? And uh, and I said, that's the highest of the hierarchy in the attitude scale. And no matter what happens to us today, tomorrow, the next day, or whatever. It's the one thing that we control. And so if you're not max fab, you need to get to max fab. And if the person next to you is not max fab, you need to figure out how to make them make them max fab. And if we're always working towards that, we'll be in the right attitudinal state to carry out the mission. Well, if you got to our trauma center and you were alive enough to see the flag in the Heroes Highway, 99.5% of you uh, went home alive. And I attribute that survival rate to this, to this attitudinal thing. Um, you can't see it very well on the video, but in the back is the Red Cross, Red Crescent, Geneva Convention compliance flag that has to fly over every medical facility in a combat zone. Well, there's not very many of those. There's probably half a dozen or, or more, just a few more. And they pulled that one off after the end of my tour, and it's still got the dust and grime on it from being over there. And they embroidered it with the traditional dates and times and that type of thing. But on the bottom of it, it says Maximum Fabulous. And so if you're going to have a, have a consulting company and you're going to work on people's, you know, culture, uh, it starts with attitude. And so why not max value? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. It's a long answer, huh? No, well, it's a good one though. I mean, I'll, I like it. And like I said, I would give you the same look of maximum fabulous. I, I would have, 
like a deer in the headlights. Like what? I never heard that answer before. It probably would have take a, taken a few seconds to try and process that. Try, you know, the next time you go to a coffee shop and you order coffee and she says, how are you doing? Say it with a little bit of authority, a little bit loud and say, I'm maximum fabulous. It'll freeze the whole coffee shop and people will start sure. giggling. Yeah, it's fun. Just try it. Okay. I, I, I will definitely do that. That's I will good. definitely do that. So I'm assuming then with that kind of attitude, you know, think, thinking that and that mindset and that mm-hmm. attitude, you probably had approached, you know, transition when you find took the mm-hmm. uniform offer the last time and stepped into the civilian world. You, you probably approached that transition kind of the same way of like, look, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to dominate this. I'm going to have the right attitude. Was, was transition difficult for you? Did you have, what kind of struggles did you have or? You know, after 30 years and you're a chief and you're really on the top of your game and you've got all this education and leadership experience and you've led teams and all that stuff. And uh, in the transition space to the civilian world, I failed miserably. Big fat F. Terrible. Uh, It's because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't have employers and people in my space that knew who I was. I didn't even understand what institutionalization meant and what it means to leave one institution and be in, 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 you know, be reinculcated into a new culture. Didn't realize that there is a, there is a literal gap between being a civilian and being a military person, veteran or otherwise. And made a lot of assumptions about the fact that people would actually understand, or all I had to do was say, well, I did 30 years in the military and that actually was tied to some level of credibility, respect, and inclusion when you're dealing with leaders that come from non-military leadership backgrounds. Uh, all fallacy. All things that I wish that I could go back to my chief and you know E8, E9, E7 days when Airman or you know young NCO Smith would say, hey, chief, I'm getting out. Uh, I've been in for six years. What, what kind of advice do you have? I used to say brilliant things like, well, get a nice tie, sit up straight at your interview, make your resume look, look kind of like this, you know, make sure you tell them and, and give them a hell, you know, cause, cause you got to First thing that I would tell them, Keith, if I, if I could go back knowing what I know today, the first thing that I would tell them is schedule an appointment with a real no kidding uh, uh, mental health professional for at least two or three visits. Even if you think you don't need it. That's because good. because because if you do and then you go out into this big scary savage world of undisciplined civilians I'm using these words you know rhetorically and 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 with some some tongue in cheek you may find that you're going to need that kind of help after you meet this new environment so that would be number 1 number 2 is as I would tell people take every second of time off that you can take off and really, really, really decide what you want to do, who you want to do it for, what kind of environment you need. And then once that's defined, go find that environment, that kind of boss, that kind of organization and those type of things. Do not jump into the first thing that that's, that's smoking. And do not say, well, I'll double dip. I'll take three weeks leave and then I'll be back on a job, but I'm, you know, I've got four months of terminal leave, so I'm getting paid and paid. And you think that, you know, you're getting a big leg up, damaging. Take the time. Save the time. Take the time. Uh, the next thing, the next thing would be, is to identify with some sort of community, either in your workspace or in your community that you're at, some sort of community, and align with them that satisfies a couple of needs that you won't know you have until you get out. The first one is, is this sense of camaraderie, this, this team thing, right? Where you're around people and you can say just about anything and people will rally to your cause. Or in our case, you know, we'll pick on you to the point where we make it, we, you know, we numb you. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, you ever seen the picture, you know, the veterans lying in bed in the hospital and the other veteran comes to visit him and he, you know, you pansy, get out of bed. What's wrong with you? It's only a broken leg. You know, you know, we got, you know, we got stuff to do, you know, but yeah. It's kind of how we treat each other, but there's a healing to that, right? And we kind of look at that. That doesn't exist on 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 average. And you're not going to find that in the in the civilian sector. So you need to you need to have that. The next thing is is that 
you're going to need a sense of purpose, something that fills the void from all this responsibility that you've been given, no matter how old you are. It's the, it's the, all right, you guys are, are guarding this area today, go. And that's an E4 and two E3s and they're in a, in a home V and off they go and they're doing their thing and they, they, they're making it happen. They're doing it right. And they're making it happen. Uh, you come back in the civilian world. Nobody knows what security is to at that extent. Nobody understands what, what operating a home V is or, or the, thousands, millions of dollars of equipment that you're around. And nobody understands the leadership and the training that you have to be able to operate that way. The only thing that they understand is, is that you're military and you're 24. That's all they know. And they also don't understand what it means to have those deep connections to the person next to you. Right. Cause there's, there's, yeah. there's, uh, there might be friends in the, in the workplace, but there's, there's not connections like we build with our battle buddies, wingmen, whatever. Right. They just don't have connections like that. Right. And, and, and we need that. And we expect that. So we make the mistake. Here's the mistake we make. You go into work and you think, oh, well, that guy's got my right. That guy's got my left. And all of a sudden you find out that that's not the case. So now you're not, you're not all in on the organization. You're not wearing the brand, you know, your name, your name tapes are not on your shirt. Even if, you know, if it's Chevron or AT&T or whatever it is, those name tapes are not there. When you start to lose that and things start to wane, then this is what I hear. And I, you know, the good news in the, in the, in the end of this, Keith, is I've run all the trap lines. I've been through the wash, rinse, spin, dry, fold cycle, right? I've run all the trap lines that go with this. I'm on the back end of this. And we're going to talk about my PTSD and my moral injury. We're going to talk about that and how I, you know, I'm, how I continue to um, identify with that. That's just the, the new pimple on my nose. And, uh, so I chose to I choose to show it off and give it a name and bring it to the party instead of trying to hide from it. Um, but uh, um, what happens is is that we start to doubt ourselves and then we start to doubt our purpose because there's no doubt when you get up in the morning and you put the uniform on you know exactly what your purpose is in life and that there's a lot of comfort in that there's a lot of goodness in that. And I think, you know, a lot of people in life tend to struggle with this and this, this purpose thing, especially younger people, non-military people, younger people struggle with this purpose thing to the point that it really causes a variances. And unfortunately, Keith, as you know, and, you know, the, the VA has now admitted that the number 22 is low because of the way they classify suicides. I mean, we're probably at a 44, 44 rate with veterans. I've heard that from a few different sources, some, yeah. somewhere in that, in that range, yeah. And so when that's happening, that's the end game to all of this, this little crescendo, this little waterfall that, uh, that, um, that I'm describing. That or homelessness or substance abuse, which uh, could yeah, also um, end up on that path, right? It's, yeah, it's long, one of those three problems. Right. And, and substance is, if I had 50 veterans in a room right now and I was talking to them, I'd say whether or not you want to admit it, whether or not you've had a true like legal problem or financial problem or a marital problem and a relationship problem. If I had a hundred veterans in a room, I would bet every single pension check that I have that um, 50% of them have some sort of unhealthy relationship with substance. And here's what I mean. If not substances, some sort of unhealthy relationship with something I, you, mm -hmm. I guess you could also throw gambling or, or all video anyhow. game addictions or some, some 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 sort of other addiction that's that's really unhealthy any of it yeah yeah and and we do that because that's a numbing thing right it takes away the pain of all of these other things so how do you fix that right how do you how do you do that because you asked about transition well we'll talk a little bit about vet ready right and that's that's my program and you know ready's an acronym and i can share with you the one page or we'll, we'll tell people how to get there our country, anytime that they've faced crisis, uh, has solved those crises almost, almost 100% of the time through public-private partnership. So I'm here in Montana, and we're number one. We 12% of Montana is veterans. That's number one or number two in the in the nation per capita. We're number one or number two in veteran suicide. We're number one and number two in veteran substance abuse. We're number one and number two in in and drinking and driving rates, and we're number 44 in services. So how do you curb that? 
right? Because you're not going to fix a services problem overnight. Because quite, no, quite that takes a lot of time and, and finances. And people that have the uh, intellectual capital to help us are not moving to Montana for a variety of reasons. That's a good point. Yeah. So how do you fix that? Well, we spend one third of our lives at work, and and Keith, we've yeah, and you've walked this walk. We all, you know, anybody that's listening to this as a veteran's walked this walk. I have to forgive every civilian institution that ever put me in a situation where I felt disrespected or I had a loss of sense of purpose or didn't identify or had to leave or had to go away. I forgive them all for one, one reason, one reason only. When we have failure, Keith, you know, in our, in our airman days, when there was failure, crash a vehicle, bump an airplane, drop a bomb, whatever it is, we asked two questions right off the bat. Who and were they trained? So, yep. so name me, name me a program. There's a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of places that will take a hundred veterans, get 95 of them jobs and say, we're winning. We got 95 job placements. We're 95% effective. But what if I told you that 50% of those 95 will quit their job in the first year because of this phenomenon I just described? Cause that's, just, that's the stat 43 out of hundred, 43% of them will, will fail in their first job because of this phenomenon that I just described. Why? Because their bosses have no training. Keith, their bosses know exactly how to take care of somebody in a wheelchair if they hire them. They know exactly how to do all the ADA stuff. They know exactly. They're better at bringing on ex-cons, prisoners, than they are at us. And, that, and you know what? Prisoners are institutionalized no different than we are. It's very, very similar. Except when you come out of prison, there's programs. There's pre-release and halfway houses and you've got to see a parole officer and people baby veterans they dump 1300 of us a day out on the streets of america and all of the people that are there that supposedly have open arms for us aren't trained on how to, how to speak klingon because we're we've been speaking klingon forever and we're now we're landing on mars there is a lot of eerie similarities there between prisoners getting out and, and service it's, members getting out yes it's and the difference is yeah well most veterans getting out at least have clean records and job skills and technical skills and things like that that make you marketable to get into employment but the employers don't even know that we have half of the stuff that we come with leadership problem solving critical thinking team building I can keep going. You know, I keep, you, know, you want me to keep going? Um, uh, volunteer, volunteerism, one. loyalty, right? Riding for the brand, right? All of those things. They don't even take that into consideration when they hire. And it, and and they, it doesn't even compute with them when you go to them and say, hey, I'm struggling a little bit here. You know, I'm feeling a little disrespected. They say, I, I don't understand. Well, the Vet Ready program teaches the civilian employers in their HR departments how to bring us on how to build the social capital uh, to help the human capital so that that 43 out of 100 number goes down to four. That's where we need to be. Because you know what? If, if we got out, we had healthy work environments where we were respected, people understood what we brought to the game and actually let us do it. I'll give you an example. My first job out of the Air Force was managing 13 subway sandwich shops in three cities in Montana. I thought that would be a piece of cake. About 100 people, it's like 100 airmen, right? Not so much. It's not so much. Out of those employees that we had, a lot of them were pre released from some sort of jail time. Misdemeanors, even some minor, you know, some minor, you know, some felonies, but you know, lower level felonies. We had to give them an hour off at any point in time to go take their P test to make sure that they were free of drugs because that was part of their, their condition of pre release. Tell me an organization out there in the United States of America that gives veterans an hour off to go to a mental health. Darn good point. We need to change that. We're going to. Or, or just even medical appointments in, in general, right? For, for All checkups, that. physical checkups, whatever for disabilities. So as, as my, uh, as my dear friend, Lieutenant Colonel retired, Kathy Gallowitz would say, I, I have a different way of saying it, but hers is more eloquent. What comes after thank you for your service? Because if you're truly thankful for something that somebody's done for you, you want to give back in some way, shape, or form. And this is 
this is truly the way to get it back, to work on your culture, to build space for us that actually keeps the camaraderie, that keeps the purpose, that keeps the, the, the value and the respect that, uh, that we need and, and, and you know, that most of us deserve unless we've done something crazy. And so that's what we're working towards. And, and quite frankly, Keith, the people that I've chosen to work with to make this move forward, which it's moving forward, to make this move forward is not the Department of Defense and it's not Veterans Affairs. And it's not the big nonprofits like the Wounded Warriors of the World that are out there doing good work. Um, no, it needs to be grassroots, chamber of commerce, large local corporations that each one community at a time, we will make them vet ready. And you know what? We're going to put it, we're going to put a sign at the entrance to the city that says veteran ready community. Now you tell me when you're getting out and you're looking for a job and there's a job in Billings, Montana, and it says veteran ready, and it outlines all of the things that the community has done to become veteran ready. Where are you going to lean to? Where are you going to take your leadership, your problem solving, your critical thinking, your loyalty, your timeliness, your discipline, uh, your volunteerism, your, your community building? Where are you going to take all of those skills and, and time and effort? You're going to take them to a community that's put time and effort into becoming vet ready. That's right. Someplace where you know or you at least have a good feeling where you're going to be supported and have a chance to succeed. Because you know, there's, a, there's always a fear of the unknown, right? You're getting out. Right. You don't know for sure what's going to happen to you, but. Right. So what happens to our suicide rates? What happens to our, our substance abuse rates? What happens to our mental health um, access and, and, you know, continuum of care? What happens to those things when we have veteran ready communities? I should go drastically down. Absolutely. And that's public private partnership. And there is some really good public companies that are big that get this JP Morgan, Deloitte, they get it. They got it. But they, they need to talk to me too. Because this is this is the next this is the next universe. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that. there's a lot of companies out there that uh, you know they get it and, and there's some of them out there that need to be slapped upside the head. Yeah. <laughs> well I need to see uh, that. The, somebody I had a dear friend who I really respect and he looked at the stuff and he goes, Boy, Dave, because you're talking about culture change and a lot of companies will run away when you're talking about, you know, a, a change in culture because they don't want to tinker with that. And I said, then I don't want to work with that company. I'll move on to the next company. You know, if I if I've got if I've got so many companies coming to me that they want this, and it becomes a problem, I've got to hire a guy like you to go teach it because we got to be in five places at once. Then 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 that's what we do, and that's a good problem. If I've got ten companies that want to do this and fifty that say they don't have time, I don't care about fifty. We'll get ten. Because 10 will bring 50 eventually. Yeah, and it's hard to teach somebody something that doesn't want to be taught. Absolutely. You know, if somebody's like, look, we are ready. We are open to a change. We know we want to yeah. change. We see what the impact is to to our culture, to organization, yeah. to our bottom dollar. Because, you know, companies, it's, it's all about the revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Like we see what all the impacts are, all these positive impacts. We're ready. You know, go if, teach if, us. If you can go through the Vet Ready program, Take those 43 veterans that are going to leave your organization in the first year, get the majority of them to stay for at least a one more year and some to stay that you say per veteran, you save about $30,000 just in turnover and training by losing those people. I've got a value. I, I have a value proposition that attaches to that, that, that talks this piece because you have to, right? I mean, people like to do things to feel good about it, but they also want the bottom line every bit. Well, absolutely, possibly. especially when yeah. it comes to business, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's all about it, the revenue. It's all it about is. the revenue. It's about the numbers. It is. You know, I mean, there's there is an element of the feel good side of like, hey, we want to help veterans, we want to do this, but it all has to make financial sense too. Yeah. I mean, you know, thirteen hundred veterans and their families, about five thousand people a day that just dump into our into our society. So there's really not a really good bridge there. And you know, when you got out, you went through TAP and all the other things that went along with that. It's pretty unsatisfying. So, yeah. Yeah, that's um, I've talked about that a few times, and it, when I tell people that that that's not a Department of Defense ran program, it's Department of Labor, you know, and if kind of really what's in it. Now I don't know what they're doing exactly today because I've been out for gosh what twelve years now, but right. it's uh, 
it's eye opening to a lot of people. They're like, wait, the Department of Labor runs that? And I was like, why do you think it's all about get out, get a job? Here's how you interview, get a LinkedIn profile. Why do you think they don't really talk about VA medical and getting, you know, they hint, they, at least when I got out, they talked about those things, but it was like a 20 minute presentation. Yeah. Here's and a manual. You do. And a manual. You got, yep. you and got papers and manuals that's that high when you walk out. Like, yeah, I'm getting out of the, I'm getting out of the Air Force. I'm going to go home and read every word on this. Piece. Exactly. The last thing I want to do is go through another set of checklists. No, you, you, know, use, you use it to make sure your fine china doesn't break when you're packing it. It's something like it's 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 still in most people's folders wherever yeah. they put all that stuff oh, yeah. when I got out. So it's yeah. it's it's a shame. Not there's good intentions there, right? Because it is important to. I think yeah. LinkedIn is a, a, a powerful platform, and it is important to have a good resume, and it is important to not have it be no, so military focused, right? Yeah. You need to civilianize it, right? And you need mm -hmm. to brush up on your interview skills and all that. Mm -hmm. Those are important things. Mm -hmm. But it's not everything. You need mm -hmm. to realize what your budget's going to be, where you're going to live, and what the financial impact is, and all the insurance and all the other civilian things. And like you said, counseling. Yeah. Just yes. even for the first three months or six months or first yeah. year, even if you go just once a month just to talk to him and be like, hey, doc, or you know, counselor mm -hmm. or whatever, here's what I'm experiencing. I'm, I'm struggling yeah. with finding a job or I've struggled with civilian interviews. It doesn't have to be all about like, hey, I'm struggling with PTSD up here. Right. I'm just right. struggling right. with the transition. I'm that close to being homeless. Right. Think think about what that means when you say that out loud before you're homeless. Right, especially to somebody who can be like, okay, all right, let's pause for a second. Yeah. I work for the VA now, you know, but hypothetical. I work for the VA now. Let's go see what resources are out here. Let's start getting mm -hmm. you with these things so you we can be um, proactive instead of reactive. If you fill out a VA disability claim, one of the questions on there is, are you homeless or almost homeless? Oh, it does say that on there, huh? Yeah. I guess it, it, it's been a while for me, so. I mean, huh. maybe I should go fill one out and click yes and see what happens to my life. You know, I don't want to, that would be a waste of their time, but yeah. You know, it's a very good question. I don't know what happens. I have to do some digging. Yeah, on that I was going to say you might want to take a note. Hmm. Yeah. Put on like an investigative journalist hat now and uh, and see what happens there. Just, I don't know just who I need to talk to you on just that. Get it, just get a guest on your show. <laughs> I know, right? That's working hmm. in the that's working in the system that probably looks like me, but has got a job at the VA doing yeah. claims. Might have to well, might have to scour LinkedIn. I'm sure there's somebody on there who's got some job title or something like that. So I'll bet you. There but, you go. Yep, yeah, there's got to be somebody there somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's the mission. That's kind of, you know, my, my road, my first nine years out and, uh, boy, I made a lot of, made a lot of bad decisions, got in the ditch, uh, I got in the bottle, started thinking about killing myself. I, I, I walked all of it, almost died from, you know, health related thing that was self-induced that I didn't, that I didn't necessarily need to go through. And, um, that's always a wake up call and got out of the booze and been out for about five years and well, more than five. And uh, there's clarity that comes along with that. There's also a conversation there's that feeling lucky. And uh, you start to say, okay, if I can't fully reintegrate into whatever it is, get up and work for somebody every day, what's the mission next? <laughs> this is the mission next. So, so what was the light bulb moment for you then that, that made you put down the bottle? And say, oh, this is enough. I, the, a blood clot from my groin to my ankle that broke loose and went all in my lungs. And it should have killed me. That's understandable. Yeah, that would yeah. make you face, I was, face a lot of things. I was, I was fat. I was 25 pounds heavier than I'd ever been in my life. I was getting sedentary. I was mad. I was mad at a lot of things. I was getting sedentary. I was just living for the next hunting season or whatever was coming around. And um and I just had a you know I had a bad attitude. You know, I wasn't Max Fab. I was a long ways from Max Fab. And I just had a bad attitude because I felt like uh um nobody valued me. And when you feel it, you know not valued, then all the really bad stuff creeps in your head. 
so yeah so there's a wake-up call there's a, a moment in time you know i'm a i'm a shock trauma er nurse you know and i'm sitting in an er and i know exactly what's wrong with me and i know exactly how lucky i am and i know exactly what i need to do and you know you have a conversation with yourself and you kind of look around and you go boy i problem number one i've been trying to do this all by myself i guess i better stick my traditional man card in my pocket and act like and then demonstrate true bravery and go get some help. And so I started building a life team. I started creating my own community, building a life team, hanging out with people that uh, that uh, were more aligned with where I needed to be, uh, that I enjoyed their company. Um, you know, that's that's drinking coffee in the morning with people that you don't drink, you know, you normally didn't. And that means that I had to exclude some people from my life that I really enjoyed their company doing certain things, but it wasn't conducive to where I needed to be. And so I had to cut those ties. I had to get a therapist, a real no kidding therapist. I needed a chiropractor for all of my physical things that go along. And I had to do that piece. I needed to have a, a relationship with a physical therapist that could help me sort out some things that weren't. And I just started building my team. Just like I built Max Fab and just like we built Vet Ready. And, you know, you just, you put your, you know, it's sweat equity. Yeah, you know you can't be. Um, I try to remember what the what the thing was. You know the the, the guy who's holding up the globe, right? You can't. Yeah, be that's Hercules. Hercules, that's right. You can't be Hercules and hold up the whole world on your shoulders. You can't do it alone. You you have to have a whole team. Yeah. And uh, that, but that's a hard thing I think for a lot of us. Even though we were used to having a whole team around us, and it was a team yeah. effort, we knew it was a team mm-hmm. effort. That's all part of the culture. <laughs> when you get out, you know it's it's usually just you. So that's. I don't know. I think for a lot of people, you just kind of get stuck in the, well, it's all on me. I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll handle, mm-hmm. you know, but you do have to. And I think once you do get a team around you, you do start seeing a quality of life improve. I still, I still make the mistake every once in a while, putting too much on my shoulders. The magic is, is that I recognize it. And then I'm like, okay, time out. And I'll look around and go, Hey, can you do this? Yep. I got it. So I had to learn yeah. to say no a couple of years ago. I, sure. I was really guilty of doing that. I would really stress myself out, put a lot of stuff on my on my plate. And then I was just like, no, you know what? I, I just can't do this. Like, this just isn't important to my life. I'm not going to do it. Or I, you know, just whatever the case may be, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take on this role or not going to do that role. Or somebody right. would offer me something like, look, I'm not, I, I'm not interested. And in I'll stay on the role that I'm doing or I've got to pull back from this or that. Right. It is what it is. I hate to do that to the organization, but I have to take care of myself first. Because if I don't take care of myself and I'm not around, I'm not good to anybody. Right. Now I, I learned it well being security forces in the Air Force. I had a yeah. a supervisor. I don't know if it was my flight chief or supervisor, but somebody told me once I was probably driving too fast. <laughs> I probably got to the call way too fast. But somebody pulled me to the side once and they said, Look, you gotta slow down and get into these calls. Which was confusing to me. And they're like slow down so you actually get to the call because if you don't get to the call you're not good you're no good to anybody at the call you know and it, it's that's resonated me with with me all these years did, later you have to be able to get there because if you don't get there you're not good to anybody but i i haven't sent you a copy of my first book have I? uh i've got a copy of giving back that's all I've yeah got. yeah there's yep. there's a there's a chapter in there that's titled slow down to go faster and it's yeah. all about what you described. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah. if, if you don't, you're not going to get there. You know, it's another thing like mm-hmm. security forces, like slow, smooth, smooth as fast. Like you, just weird. Like you just have to do this, this kind of things. But everybody, yeah. man, you have to build a team around you. I've done it. Yeah. You've done it, Dave. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I've got my medical team. You know, I've had community care. I've had mm-hmm. uh, mental health providers. I've gone to physical therapy at the VA for things. Um. I mean, you have to build the team whole health of the VA. That's another good, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that one. That's a great resource. Uh, I did that one for a little while. They, they, the thing was my doctor approached me about it. I was like, I don't know. But then I was like, well, I have this podcast. I might as well do it to see what it's about. I, I was in the program for, I don't know, six, seven months. And I right. thought it was great. I had a great whole health coach that eventually transitioned to me going into a nutritionist and then meeting with a nutritionist kind of put me more on the path of losing weight. I'm down like 60 pounds since last November. So that's huge. Congratulations. Like, it, it's, it's all part of the team, right? right you know, I, right. I credit a lot of my success to those people, right. and the accountability and the team. And it's all VA resources. Absolutely. 
So you have to have a team. So, yeah. hey man, but, good job. You did a great job of, of uh, describing boundaries and how to live within the things you can control and not letting those exterior things bother you. You know, where you're talking about saying no and just moving on and staying focused on what you can control. That's uh, that's hugely important in a lot of ways. But yeah. yeah. It, it is, but it's not. It's not an easy thing to, no. to recognize. It's, it's, mm. It takes a long time, and it's going to take a lot of pain sometimes for some people to to get to that point of it. Like, okay, enough is enough. I I can't do X Y Z anymore. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. but you know, is is what it is. But I, I did want to jump into a, sure. another topic that you mentioned because uh, yeah. I definitely want to talk to about it. Yeah. That's moral injury. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so you know. You wanted to bring that up. Uh, I know it's been talked about a couple times on my podcast, but you know, in, in your own words, because because you're the medical professional here, sure. what is moral injury, and how can we kind of recognize that in ourselves or or what it is? I I knew I'm the, I'm the proud owner of both, so PTSD has a lot to do with the combat trauma care type thing. Unsee, unhear, unsmell. Right? That's just the stuff that will never go away. So. That's wart number one that I own. And it's good. I give it a name and own it. And, and so I'm the proud owner of that. Moral injury is that thing that uh, is counterintuitive to how we're programmed. This is our inner child. This is the stuff that your mom and your dad told you, that your priest and your baseball coach told you, and everybody else, right? These things that ground you. You know, you don't, you don't harm things. You don't kill things. You don't hit women, whatever, whatever, whatever your foundationally is set forth. And then we get into an environment where we have doctrine and direct orders. Military doctrine is very specific on how you do things, especially in preparing for battle. I mean, it's, it is, I mean, it's, and it's refined constantly, right? The next time, you know, we, we go into battle, we come out, we say, we're going to change the doctrine. You know, we're going to put in tanks before we put in airplanes or whatever, whatever the doctrine is. Right. Yeah, this didn't work. That didn't work. We're going to try right. We'll do it this way. <laughs> and so the doctrine drives the direct orders, right? The ATO, the tasking order, right? And when the tasking order comes out, you do what you're told. Whatever it is, 15 man team, go guard X, Y, and Z. You've and been on a rules 15- of engagement and everything. Oh, with right. It. Right. So, and that's it. Some of those things um, that exist, it's just like sending missileers to the field every day and they understand if they turn the keys that, uh, you know, they may be responsible for millions of lives going away. Well, that's pretty counterintuitive to some people's morality, right? Now, they're not turning the keys every day, thank God, but if they had to, would they? Because there's a decision point. And and that and it's not it's not that the fact they're bad officers, bad people, bad Americans, not patriotic. It's the fact that a lot of the things that we're asked to do in the high in the high critical situations in the United States military are fly in the face of our foundational morality, our morals. Right. So well, I'm going to tell people, you, re- regardless of whether or not you were born and raised, you know, religiously or not, but a lot of people kind of have the like the, you shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't kill people. Right. You mm-hmm. know, the 10 commandments, we'll just use Christianity, 10 commandments, yeah, but like, absolutely. but just being in the military, what do you do? You carry weapons and you're mm-hmm. prepared to support and defend the constitution. And mm-hmm. you're willing to fight anybody for that based yeah. on the rules of engagement, everything we already talked yeah. about. Like, and you have, that and just you have, in and of itself is like, you are prepared to do yeah. unimaginable things. And you have rules that if you follow them to a T it's legal for you to take somebody else's life. After 18 years of hearing, oh, no, you shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't steal. Well, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Or, or, but, or you turn on the TV and another guy in handcuffs is going off to jail because he killed somebody. I mean, just our laws, mm-hmm. right, which they're all different. So, yeah, I'll tell you the story. I think I've shared it with you um, at some level. But, you know, people ask me, tell me about moral injury and the difference between that and PTSD. because, And I've had family members call me because they don't understand it. So in, in 08, Iraq, same thing we talked about a little bit earlier with Max Fab, doctrine met morality. And at that time in Sauter City, the bad guys were hammering the green zone pretty bad. Sauter City's suburb of, of uh, Baghdad. So I don't want to talk down to everybody, but I won't make the assumption everybody knows where that's at. 
So the bad guys are pounding on the green zone with um, indirect fire pretty bad to the point that it's getting, well, it's getting annoying and it's getting deadly. So the battle plan's drawn up to take Sadr City. Well, that's going to look like Fallujah or Ramani. Street to street, house to house, Marines and soldiers, right? Foot, foot soldiers going slow, lots of casualties. When you do medicine in a combat zone, the doctrine dictates that before the operation starts, you clear the beds. This is the title of the chapter in the second book. It's the title of the chapter that's going into a book that I'm co-authoring with uh, 11 other veterans. And it's a keynote speech. It's taken me forever to have to write it. It's taken me forever to tell it. So this is fairly fresh. So the order comes to clear the beds. Well, what was going on inside of our facility was, and people don't realize this, is we weren't just taking care of, of, of military members. We were taking care of civilians, some of them young kids. And we had about a dozen of them that were in our intensive care unit. And we had had them there so long, it looked like a civilian hospital. We knew their families. We had visitation. We bring them in from off base. Uh, we knew all of their names, all of it. You know, and these people were on ventilators and really, really critical care. And at that time in Iraq, our hospital was the only hospital that could provide that level one trauma care. Well, the order came to clear the beds, which means we have to move these people. We had one option to move them, and that was to fly them to Baghdad, put them on helicopters with all of their stuff, with the right team, and fly them to Baghdad and drop them at an Iraqi hospital, about the best hospital that they had in the country, but definitely not up to our standards, nor did they have the capabilities. We knew that the process was, is once the patients came off the all helicopters, they pulled out all the tubes and all the wires and everything. And if you lived, you lived. And if you didn't, you didn't. So we knew that if we flew these 12 people up to Baghdad, that we were going to kill them. We were going to euthanize these 12 people to make room, to, to, to make an empty bed for the next soldier or Marine that was going to fight in, in the streets of Sadr City. Well, can you imagine in a hospital full of medical professionals that have all taken oaths to do no harm and the Hippocratic oaths and those type of things and have been through medical school and their surgeons and their signal and everything, can you imagine what that is, the organizational dynamic and the leadership position trying to manage that with people? I'm sure that got pretty pretty heated. It, and uh, almost to the point of fistfights. Uh, and, I'm talk, and, I'm, and I'm talking about lieutenant colonels wanting to punch master sergeants and airmen wanting to punch neurosurgeons. Because um, the sides were split and, and you know, what do you do? You know, that's a my commander at the time, we, you know, we, we were the team, you know, we're the command team. Uh, unbelievable human being. And the grace that he led with through this, which there was no easy way out, uh, I think is phenomenal. Wasn't perfect. Drove a lot of congressional inquiries and stuff like that after this happened. So what we did, Keith, was we flew them all out. We flew them all to Baghdad. We euthanized 12 people to clear the beds, to get the hospital back to a steady state where there wasn't a single person in the bed. And we never did the operation. Oh, no. That's moral injury. And that's something that we all have to live with forever. And I'll tell you, when you're on the wrong side of things after you transition into the civilian world and you don't have the right help and you're not saying the right things and you think you can handle it by yourself and you turn to the three easy, cheap counselors in the world, John, Jimmy, and Jack, it can go downhill pretty quick. So for those out there listening right now that that maybe are tuning into the Battle Buddy podcast because they want to know about something military that they don't because they're not, this slippery slope ends in suicide from 44 of us every day. And I'm not saying every of the 44, everybody has moral injury, everybody has PTSD. Sometimes it's just this loss of sense of purpose, loss of hope, loss of being able to fit in. That's moral injury. And that flies totally in the face of what we as counterintuitive, especially our culture, especially Western United States culture, it flies in the face of that. And so that's a story amongst probably a half dozen that I could tell you where morality met doctrine and, and 
orders and it didn't marry up. And I, I can take you all the way back to the, to the airfield in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993 and walk you all the way forward to 2008. And probably every three or four years, give you an example of something similar to that. Now I'm sure you got quite a few of them over, over that many years. So, and that's not, that's not about my moral, my, my moral injuries worse than your moral injury. It's not that. A moral, yeah, moral injury is a moral injury. And and you can be moral injury injured at, at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, and you can be moral injured at Fort Drum, New York, and you can be moral injured at Camp Lejeune. Or, you know, maybe Miramar. It, you never know how, how it's going to affect you or how long it's going to affect you. Uh, I mean, I had one incident when I was in at, at Balad you know, that really messed me up for years. It took a long time for me to realize that none of what happened was my fault. I just happened to be the one who scanned this guy's, it was retinal scan. He popped in the system. It wasn't on me. It was on the intelligence guys. And they said, yeah, he's wanted, but we don't want to talk to him. Cut him loose. It wasn't my fault that he was found dead in a ditch the next day outside the base. But for years, I, I took that as... I was the one it was all on me for I, for more than 10 years. You know, I would think about that guy multiple times a week, like it was my fault, you know, but it took a lot, a lot of time and a lot of counseling to be like, none of that was really my fault. Like, I don't know, luck, whatever. Like, I guess it was just his day. I didn't, I didn't have any direct, you know, I wasn't the one who pulled the trigger, but just there's there's all kinds of things that can happen. Like you said, it could happen to Seymour Johnson. It could happen to Scott Air Force Base. It could happen in Montana. It could happen to Korea. Anywhere in the world, you know, it could um, it could happen on the uh, streets in New York City if somebody gets hit by a car and you decide not to go give aid, even though you know how to uh, you know put somebody, I don't know, to to do some basic first aid, and you decide not to do something and somebody gets hurt, right? It anything can happen, and you don't know how it's going to affect you long term. So. No, I agree, man. I, your story is powerful. We talked a little bit about that, and you know, and you know, look at the counseling you went through. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well, that's the power of, of counseling. So, and uh, you know, it, yeah, PTSD, moral injury, a lot of those things. It's uh, you have to get you have to get the help for it. Build a team, right? We just right. well, talked about and, that not too and, long ago. And here's the thing that we need to understand. That here's the thing that we need to remember is that. The people that we need to get help from do not have to be veterans, do not have to have, quote unquote, been in this stuff, right? They don't. They yeah, don't, don't spend Actually, your time looking specifically for somebody who has, because right. that's going to be searching for a needle in a haystack. My therapist is, uh, she's Armenian. She came from war-torn Armenia and immigrated here. She still has broken English. I, every once in a while, I have to, I'll say a word, and she goes, you have to explain it to me. So I do. <laughs> I do. And she works with a pile of military people. And actually her life experience really marries up well with kind of what we went through. And I always tell her I'm going to reverse the charges on her because she has other military people that come in. And then I end up drawing these Napoleonic charts on her whiteboard because she wants to understand how supervision works in the military because people are complaining about their boss or their, you know. So I, I have go. to explain how the chain of command works. And she goes, oh, okay. And I say, yeah, I'm reversing the charges on you. You're going to have to pay me for this. But uh, um, no, we have a tremendous relationship and she's, uh, she's, uh, very patient with me, but she gives me an, actually a different perspective to make me understand. One is this is not a military specific thing. You know, think about, think about all the things that you know that are right and good. And then, and then if you're a female, you get raped. That puts everything in doubt. That's the ultimate injury. That's the only, and you got to, you know, so you, know, you have to recover from that. You got to get to a point where you can recover from that. You're going to have to have help with that. So it's not just a military thing. I mean, it's it's a thing. And we just need to talk more about it so that people understand what it is and then they can go get help for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody, I, I'm a firm believer to everybody in this country, military or not, everybody should have a counselor and everybody should see one at least a couple times a year, get the help you need you should treat it almost like your tax professional, your medical doctor, your dentist visits, <laughs> at least like, you know, just those things that you just do, <laughs> those checkups kind of thing. Well, like, like open and pack, 
opening packages during Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever religious celebrations you have, the 4th of July, anything. Uh, we, we do things so routinely based on what time of year it is. Throw your mental health thing in there. Yeah, do it once a quarter. Just yeah, four put it on your year, schedule. Check in, be like, yep, I'm good. Here's what's happened in the last quarter. The, the dentist does life. not let you leave until they schedule your next appointment. The dentist doesn't make sure your mental health provider Absolutely. Doesn't. Same thing with your eye doctor. You can schedule Amen. your appointment for the next year or whatever. Next year. So, absolutely. So it's it's important to, to do that, which I think is a key lesson here out of this conversation is right. to, you have to build a team. You have to get the care you need and you have to build a team. All right. And it's, you know, look at the name of your podcast and then think about the, what that really means when we're serving. But I one of the one of the things that I opened that ready with this is the creeds of each of the uh, uh, institutions. Right? You know, the Airman's Creed ends with, you know, I'll I'll never leave an Airman behind. I will not falter. I will not fail. That's heavy. That's us. Yeah. Yet we get out in the world, and then we we lose our. We don't find a new battle buddy. We think people aren't worthy because they haven't. They're they're noners, right? They haven't done it. And that's, that's not true. They're actually sitting there will, ready, willing, and able to help. We just got to let them in. You got to let them in and you have to ask. Mm -hmm. You have to ask for help because people just, they don't know you need help unless you tell them that you need help or you ask that you need help. Mm -hmm. You have to ask. And even if they think you need help, it's a big, scary place. That's a big step to take to intervene at that level to say, I think you need help. Yeah. It's, yeah. So you got to ask, you got to build, um, almost like a muscle memory, I guess, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way, when it comes to asking for help, you have to get in the habit of asking for help on little things before yeah. it gets to this big yeah. monumental thing. That's just going yeah, to just explode. Right. Before it's a blood clot. Like a blood clot. Like, yeah, you have to be like, look, I, I'm kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, it could be with anything, right? It could be yeah. with finances or it could be handling, struggling with childcare, whatever. Reach out to friends, family, neighbors, connections, whatever, and be like, hey, look, I'm really struggling with something. I could really use some help. Uh, I have a really hard time um, letting my dog out, right, when I'm at work. And maybe your neighbor works from home. Be like, if, if I give, you know, if you trust your neighbor, right, just a hypothetical situation. If I give you access to my house or if I unlock it remotely, can you come over and let my dog out, right? Maybe that just takes enough stress off of you to just let you live a little bit better of a life. Or maybe it's getting your mail or... Um, I don't know. Just, I mean, there's all kinds of little, because sometimes it's just little things in life that can add up. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's the accumulation of all the little things that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. So, you know, sometimes you have to build that team and be like, hey, I need, I need you to take care of this. Maybe yeah. it's cooking dinner for your spouse. Like maybe you're the one that does all that. Be like, could you cook dinner twice this week? Could you do the groceries? Could you do the laundry this week? Like, I just need a mental break. Yeah. I, I do that. I do that. I do that for my wife. I do that there for her. Go. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. I'm in. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, it comes down to communication, right? Right on. Absolutely. Well, Amen. that's that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. Bring me back. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk. Absolutely. We'll talk. On, there's only two kinds of communication, Keith. Not well, enough. Not verbal. No, not enough and too much. Oh. That's a unique twist on it. When when you're a command chief, there's only two types of communication. Not enough or too much. You either you either didn't tell me or you're driving me crazy. Nobody's ever complete. Nobody ever says, boy, you communicate exactly at the right amount at the right time with the right, you know, information. So that's a, that's an interesting perspective. I never really thought about, but yes, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I've just felt that pain. So Yep. That explains like uh, how I, I, I can tell my wife all the time when it comes to the news and stuff, I don't really pay attention to the news, but uh, like when the news is on, I'm like, why are they keep talking about this so many hours later? I was like, maybe it's just as a military guy. Like I just need short, simple. I just like, yes. I just need to know the basic details. Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Just, I, don't, yeah. I don't need all that extra information. Right. That's yeah. your oversharing. Right That's there right. That we, we, we will adjust fire as needed. But I don't need I don't need the whole playbook right now. Just get me going. So yeah, yeah. but there's some things like you just need you got to pound that in, right? Like right. Just, like right. this mental health, right? We're gonna pound that in. So, but anyway, uh, Dave, I I, yeah. I do appreciate you coming on here, and sharing. Um, I'll, I'll throw that Max Fab Consulting up there. Yeah. And I'll have a link to your book in the show notes yeah. as well. Giving back, 
I'll throw that back up there again. New, so new book's coming. That you can you can you can uh, you can pre-order the new book. Awesome. It's titled, it's titled "When the Cows Lie Down," and it's about the subtle it's about the subtle signs in life that uh, can point us to to danger and and give us the ability to act before it's a problem and and uh, and why people quit you the leader. Oh, that'd be a good one. I can't wait to see that to, to read that one too. So I'll get you. I'll get you one, buddy. <clears throat> Sounds good. So yeah. everybody, you go check it out. The links are down below. And uh, Dave, once again, I appreciate you stopping by and sharing with us. God bless you, and thanks for doing what you do, man. Yep. Good stuff. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed. Remember, as always, go check out the website, battlebuddypodcast.net. Remember, if there's a resource not on there you think should be, please let me know. And remember to hit the like and subscribe button and follow the podcast and share it with your battle buddies. And if you're struggling for any reason, remember to call 988-PRESS-1 or you can text 838-255.